So, you know, so it's the conversation I'm sure is being repeated over and over again in New York is the industry is going through massive transformation. And so I, I'm going to start this conversation with what I think is happening in Australia, but it actually is happening, I think, across all the OECD countries, which is we're, we had power systems that were built post-World War II, that were built at a time where central station power plants were a very efficient way of delivering energy as all our economies were really becoming increasingly electrified, and that these po massive power systems, we used, um, you know, the, used to call this the major engineering feat of the 20th century, where you had these huge integrated systems, made a lot of sense um, for economies of scale, growing economies, all those things. But things have definitely changed. So one thing that's changing is the fact that you're saw, seeing falling cost of solar and wind, and batteries, and other technologies. The other thing that's, that's changing is consumer preference. And of course, and then the other third piece that's changing is energy policy. But the other piece that I think is becoming more and more of reality and a recognition is that where, where I would say, you know, those of us who grew up and remember, you know, like the small is beautiful and all that, where the, you know, there was a sort of idea, there's a dichotomy because between an environmentalist and a business person that the triple bottom line was just a dream, is that that's simply not true anymore. To massive companies, large companies, old companies, really saying that economic sustainability and environmental sustainability are one and the same. It is really good for the bottom line to be efficient. And so that is changing. So not only do we have individual preferences, but I think there's a recognition. So, so I'm going to sort of start as a given that in this, particularly in this audience, I'm not going to debate whether the energy industry is in a transformation. It's in a transformation. Solar and wind are falling. I think they're probably a grid parity in many parts of the world. And certainly if I look at AEMO, we have 21,000 megawatts of connection requests, all solar and wind. We have 90,000 installations of PV every month across Australia. So this, this rate of change is faster than we've ever seen in this industry. And it's something that, frankly, for our industry, the power industry, and I would say the energy industry as a whole, really, really been an interesting change. So where people used to think about change in this industry happening in decades, they're really seeing rapid changes in months. And so CEOs across in, in most of the companies I talk to are actually now done seeing this future as something that may be the next person's job to deal with, is it's their job to deal with, that they're going to create healthy companies. And so we really have to go, it's not, it's not a question of whether, it's a question of how. And, and the how is how do we make this transition in an efficient way. So one of the things that uh, um, you know, Dr. Finkel and I have talked about is people miss a lot in what he said, is the objective has to be a sane transition, because the transition is occurring, and what we need to do is guide that in a way that doesn't create too much disruption for the economy. And so a lot of the recommendations were about how do we make this transition in a way that's, that's efficient and effective. So, the, so that's what I'll talk about today. So, so I think about it in these terms as the energy system. We always talk about it as a system. It is a system, but it's essentially a system of systems, and it's multiple systems. So you know, our first job at AMO is reliability and security. And so when we think about the system, we really think about the power system. So one of the things that has to change, and we think about a lot, is we're going from a power system that was synchronous, uh, dominated by thermal resources that provide inertia, that provide frequency, that provide voltage, provided all the things that are required to make a power system work, to resources don't, that don't necessarily have that capability. And that the system we're having, we're operating today, is much different than the system we operated historically. So before, where you would basically had thermal resources that you could turn on and turn off, and demand itself was fairly predictable, that's changing. So as we have more higher penetrations of solar, we're seeing demand, uh, for example, last weekend in uh, South Australia, demand was 800 megawatts, 100 megawatts less than it was last year from photovoltaic installation. But when that sun stops shining and that demand starts coming up, we gotta need it. And so understanding how to meet those kind of variabilities and, 
the types of resources we need to do to manage that is one of the things we're thinking about. So we, uh, the AAFC issued a rulemaking this week, a set of rules, I should say, that we had asked for about how, how do we make, maintain frequency on the system. So as, you, as everyone knows from last summer, the, the, the um, system black that occurred in South Australia, and we see it now a lot, is there many times we have so much wind, not much to, enough demand, and the system can't manage it. So we actually have to turn on gas units during those hours in order to avoid losing the system. Well, that's not really what any of us want. So we have to design the capability to manage through that. It's not a question of a preference for one fuel type or not. It's a preference for making sure the system is still a physical system, still needs an engine, still has frequency, still has voltage, all those issues that we have to solve for. So we're dealing with those issues. The other question is, is the issue that we saw us raise in our advice to the, to the government last week was around uh, what I would call, we say dispatchability, in the United States, we talk about it as uh, operating reserves. It's the capability for the system to respond. Again, it's not just it's maintaining the system, but it's also saying if we if the wind stops blowing, something has to increase because if customers are using power, how do we do that? So it's having a, a system that can be responsive. That could be through storage. That could be through hydro. Could be through demand response but it's having those tools. So one, and the third thing that we're dealing with is predictability. So I, you know, I, we, I came, I started in this industry in 1988. And one of the things that we used to sort of always guide and look at our operators to do is what we call the PJM perfect dispatch. Was their ability to use a learning algorithm to say, well, if it's going to be uh, 20 degrees and it's a Wednesday, and it's um, during a period of time where people are at work, we should be able to look back and figure out what the demand is going to be. And what I rated my operators on was how good they were at being able to forecast so that we weren't we were running the right units and that we weren't running too much or too little. So we called it perfect dispatch because they would a day before, so today they'd be planning for tomorrow. Well, guess what? That doesn't work anymore. Because you know, cloud cover can change. Everything can change. So every year, it's a little bit like it's it's not Groundhog Day. It's actually a totally different day. And so the tools that we need, and this is where we need the universities to help us, is to create these learning algorithms, these neural networks, these very smart AI to start dealing with all the the variations that can happen in the system. So a lot of what you're clear about the email doing is actually saying these resources can work, but we have to be a lot more sophisticated, a lot more granular, a lot more precise, because that's the way the world is, is headed, so that we can signal to the market exactly what kind of capabilities the system needs to have, because the system is still a system. So, that, so that's one thing that's changing. The other thing that we're going to manage through the transition is moving from the power system that was one way to truly two way, and that's, that's really the reason, one of the major reasons I was so excited about coming here and thought of this huge opportunity we have in Australia. So, so something that happened in this electric industry in the last um, portion of the 20th century and the first portion of this century is that generation became more and more competitive. So we created good markets like AEMO where, where generators were not owned by incumbent monopoly. They were separately owned and we were bidding and trading electricity. And so that, that created a lot more efficiency because what we're doing is maybe managing the resources better. One of the things so that, that we have an even better opportunity to do is actually using demand. So the system was built up on the idea that demand was inelastic, which it largely was, and that therefore you always had enough resources not only to meet the demand, but if the biggest resource fell over, you can immediately turn on something else and meet the demand because the demand wasn't going to go away. It was pretty inelastic. Everyone was going to not change. Well, that's changed, obviously. But what's more importantly is that we can use distributed resources. People call it the democratization of energy, where we can use rooftop solar, we can use storage, we can use electric vehicles, we can use hot water heaters, we can use um, actually smart thermostats to actually think about how to make the system more efficient. Because what, one of the things that is sort of the hallmark of the power system 
is because electricity is the only product that really readily can't be stored. It has to be consumed and produced simultaneously. Is you always needed a lot of reserves because just in case something broke. You didn't, couldn't put it in a water tower or a tank or anything like that. You had to have a generator that was ready to go. <coughs> well, what if instead of creating more generation, we use demand? What if we can use these resources that are sitting behind the meter? If you're putting in solar and you're putting in storage, you have an electric vehicle, or you can store energy in your hot water heater and use that at night. How do we use those better so that rather than building another peaking unit to just be there just in case and transmission and distribution, we start to use demand better. So we're using the resources and making the system more productive. So the major you know, innovation now that's now occurring is that rather than thinking about rooftop solar and these things as a threat to the power system, actually they're a new customer group. And the role of the power system is to aggregate and optimize those to drive productivity throughout the entire system. And the value then is saying that what we're changing in the power system is we're going from something where you had a bulk power system where you have generators meeting demand and demand the usage itself being fairly passive and, and I would say dumb to smart demand where it's actually responding to a price. I'm not, just, I'm not going to turn people into uh, day traders for energy, but if you set your thermostat and you have a Nest thermostat and the Nest thermostat is reading a price and you've told your provider that if it goes above a certain amount you can turn my thermostat up a couple degrees, I don't care. You can, char you can circulate my pump. You can circulate my hot water heater. All of a sudden, that's 700, 800 megawatts. Two power plants just sitting in the cities that we need to use. And that drives value. It helps reduce price. It obviously helps reduce emissions. So it, there's nothing, it's all about productivity, which is when you think about digitalization. That's what digitalization does. It provides that productivity. So for us, the big thing about AEMO is saying, we want to make the power system more productive. We want to make it more efficient, which means we want to make it two-way. And we want to use these distributed networks. We can even use what we call microgrids, where you have small embedded systems where people are putting storage and solar together and they're serving their needs to actually drive productivity. The good thing about that is, one, is we'll create more competition. Second, we'll reduce price. Third, we'll demonstrate that environmental and sustainable outcomes are, not, are consistent with economic outcomes. And the other thing is, is that we're going to grow capacity and capability throughout our energy economy that I think, in addition to some of the things that we've always done historically in Australia, will become the new energy economy. Because the things we're talking about here are the things that people are talking about everywhere. But one of the other pieces that I find terrifically exciting, and, and you know, one part of my resume that uh, often isn't talked about, is I started my professional career after university as a the U.S. with a Peace Corps volunteer living in Chad, Africa, where people didn't have access to energy. And so energy access is a big, important thing for me. And so we can develop these capabilities of how to use these resources better. There's still two billion people in the world without access to energy. They're not going to pick the build big power systems. They're going to build microsystems. Why not have Australia lead in that? Because our system is really a series of microsystems. We don't have like the United States and, Aust and, and Europe, where you have people all over, we have really a bunch, a lot of urbanization. So to me, there's this other piece of where the technology innovation is going to occur in this industry, and why not have Australia lead in that as well. So it's all good. So the power system is one thing that we're looking to change. The other are the market systems that go with it. And that's really the fact that we're saying if we are going to use Demand. So again, think about AEMO's role. Our job as the power system operator is to keep supply and demand in balance. That's the way it always works. So if, if you're using more electricity, I either have to turn on a generator or I have to find a consumer who says, oh, well, I, have, I can actually have a battery I've charged up. I'll use that instead. And for us as a system operator, it has the same value. Because all we're trying to do is keep it in balance. So if somebody is able to manage demand, and we use that instead of using supply, that gives us an opportunity to actually compensate them. For Because what we're trying to do is, again, drive efficiency throughout the system. And for a system operator, we want to take the lowest cost resource 
to drive the outcome we want to achieve, which is system balance. And so it, to us, it's the same value as a system operator. <coughs> to you as a consumer, <coughs> it could be even better value because what drives prices in your power system is demand. And if we're able to reduce demand, that drives down, it's sort of the law of commons, it's good for everybody. So that's one of the things why, so this year, one of the things that we worked on with ARENA was to say, how do we create a demand management market in, in, in Australia? Because there's a huge opportunity here. And I, I had a chance to visit, visit with um, distribution utility in Queensland. They're already working with their customers. They use the pool pumps, they use uh, hot water heaters and thermostats, and they manage demand without, and you know, so there's been a lot of press on this, and I just hope you guys, it's not turning out lights. It's circulating this. You don't even notice it. You haven't recognized it. It's, it's taking your air conditioner, turning it off for 15 minutes, and turning it back on. And so it's those kinds of automation that makes sense. In Queensland, they said that they have about eight to 900 megawatts of that capacity just sitting there. You, they're using it to manage the reliability of the distribution system. But again, that's, that's too many power plants. Just by using energy in a, smarter in a way that is undetectable by people. So it's that kind of stuff we want to unleash. The other today, I was also at Arena has what they call these A-labs, where they bring in innovators and they come up with their ideas. And what's made, what I love going to that, and sort of one of the reasons I think so it's always fortunate for people who get to work at universities to see these really smart, smart people with these great ideas. And they just, you know, they, they just need the encouragement, the capability to bring it to fruition. So the other thing that we're doing in the markets, and this is the arena piece, is we're going to do these demonstrations. And so Joe Witters is sitting here, we set up an innovation center at AEMO. And the idea is this. We built this industry on, this, on a very fully regulated piece. We never did things unless we didn't have tariffs. And we wouldn't have these long proceedings and utilities would beg us for change. And it would take years before anything changed because we were all risk averse. Utilities were risk averse, regulators were risk averse, and customers just didn't, you know, weren't, weren't particularly engaged. Well, that's changing. And so one of the things that we have to think about as technology is changing is the markets need to allow proof of concepts. We need more innovation. We need to allow experimentation in sandboxes before we take it, because it is a real-time system. So one of the other things we're looking at to do in the markets is more and more of these proof of concepts, where we're using communities to say, well, how would it if we get a total community engaged, or what, what we call virtual power plants, where you assemble and aggregate a whole bunch of small solar and storage, and suddenly, from our perspective, it looks like a big power plant. Um, how do we get customers engaged, looking at different pricing mechanisms? How do we use systems better, get better algorithms written? So it's all those types of things that we think, I think that first of all, AIMO is doing, and we're gonna, we use it as a way, because rather than trying to get things engineered to the nth degree, it's actually some form of added development that we've really done in other industries and we can do here. So that's the other piece we work on. Um, and the other elements of the markets is better pricing, better, more accurate pricing so people can engage in the markets. The third system that's really critical is the regulatory system. And of course, that, that was what I used to do. Um, so this is not an emo, but this is how we have to think about it, is that the business models are changing. And we can't expect that we say, use the same regulatory formulas as we've done historically and expect to have different outcomes. So, so thinking about, for example, and this is to me one of the critical pieces, the role of the distribution utility. We used to think of the distribution utility as that entity who just delivered energy to your meter. That's all they did. You know, and they, I mean, it's not, a world, it's not a, like a small thing. It's a big thing. It's really complicated to run these systems. But now you have these consumer groups, you, who are putting solar on your roof and storage and are becoming prosumers. And so there all becomes the question is, what is the role of the distribution utility to enable these kind of markets, to provide you the data and information necessary, the services, so that if you're investing in these resources, they can be used in the most efficient way to manage the grid. So understanding that historically, regulation was all about building capital, not necessarily incenting customers to really go off the grid 
So you're going to create this tension, right, between the traditional utility mindset and you as a customer who might want to consume less and be more independent. So the way to change that is really change the model and start thinking about how can the utility make money really from not building transmission, not building a substation, but enabling efficiency. And so things that are being discussed in Australia, certainly things we did in New York, are all about changing that mo economic model because you can't expect a utility to embrace selling less, less megawatts with the Lytonia car dealer. You should love this. You're not going to sell cars anymore. It's going to be good for you. <laughs> so, so we have to change that model. So that's the other piece that has to change is, is that. And also, again, allowing innovation. We got, we, 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 with this level of change and rapidity of change, you can't simply allow, expect people to sort of uh, come up with a solution. They, they need an opportunity to try things in a safe space. And I think we're seeing that in the AER and in regulatory changes in Australia is allowing that innovation. Now, there are two things that I think can't change. And, and, and have to be thought through as we make this transition. One is uh, the social welfare aspects of energy. So we still have a very much of a major issue around ensuring affordability. And you know, for some, many consumers, thankfully, energy, even with prices, I know going high here, you look at your overall income, you're, you know, most consumers are not making choices, but many consumers have to. And so it is an essential service that is not going to go away. And so we have to think about what are the, you know, how do we provide that social good? Some of the things that people are thinking about in this industry is it's a difficult issue is that, and, and we saw this in uh, New York, where historically, and I'll put this in Aussie dollars, historically the average income in New York that put solar on the rooftop was about a quarter million a year. That was the people who were putting solar on their roof. People who were making $60,000 a year weren't putting solar on their roof. A lot of them didn't have roofs because they lived in multi-unit buildings, right? So the problem then becomes, if there's grid defection, but you still have to manage the grid, the cost of this grid, this network, which is older, is being put more and more on those who are left behind. So it creates a difficulty. One is they don't have access to the new innovation. And the second is they're going to be paying more and more for the electricity because those costs won't go away. They're socialized, right? And they stay the same. So we have to think through in this transition, how do we make sure that the boats are lifted for everybody, that there's access and there's business models so you're not creating this, this diseconomy, and which makes it more expensive. So it's those kind of pieces, I would say, don't, we don't talk, we, we, I mean, people talk about, we're talking about affordability, a lot of studies about it, but understanding that, that electricity is, is a common good in many ways, and that we have to preserve that commonality is, it remains important. The other thing that I think it, it will not change are the financial system. So, so one of the things that's very important as we think about this transition is the fact that these are massive investments, very expensive. You want to keep the cost of capital low because if the system is seen as risky, I, um, I you know, um, Warren Buffett owns one of the major utilities in the United States. And, um, there was a period in the United States in the 1990s where all the, you know, there's a big, utilities are kind of like, you know, lemons. One person says something, then they all, they all say it. Um, and so the thing that it was, was like, oh, we have to have 10% growth. Internet is doing 10% growth, we got to do 10% growth. And year over year, 10% growth. It was no utility ever grew at 10%. But all of a sudden, they all felt like their income had to grow at 10%. And Buffett made this very nice announcement. He said, well, frankly, he, you know, he wants his electric utilities to be a good investment, not a great investment. That's why he invested in them. They're a bond. And so we have to think about that this is a, these systems are expensive. They're highly capital intensive. Um, one of the issues in Germany was that the loss of capital in, in, the, in the traditional industries which becomes very expensive for consumers. And in an economy like Australia, we had the same issue in New York, we could not afford for our utilities to become bad investments. And so having, and then also as we're investing in generation, in solar, anything, wind, right? You want to have predictability. So it's going to be very, very important as we make this transition 
that the financial markets seem very predictable. And that's one of the things they talk about. You know, certitude, predictability around policy is very important for them. Then they can figure out their investment strategy. But uncertainty is what leads to capital strikes and, and change. And so the other piece then, and, and you've heard me, I think you've probably heard me say this, that's why this issue of affordability is so critical. Because um, public policy makers understand demand degradation, whether it's because people can't afford it or because companies go elsewhere or can't afford to expand because energy is too expensive is a bad thing. And that's what's going to cause governments to intervene because it's a public good and they almost have to, which is going to cause investors to get worried, which is going to cause them to raise their cost of capital. And so it all sort of starts to swirl, which is why the, the, the Finkel, again, turning back, his blueprint talks about certainty, predictability, and having a smooth transition. I don't know if that was his reason, but I'll add to it, because it's very important to keep this financial system also wanting to invest in this sector with a great deal of confidence that they know the rules of the road and that they could therefore at least have managed risk outcomes. So those are sort of the way we see it. Our focus is obviously on the first two, but the others have to work in order for us to be able to do our job. So um, that's it for me. And I'm happy to answer any questions and um, anything else you might want to talk about. Thank you. Microphone to get to people who have questions. Uh, I think we'll have two. One coming up the side, and one coming up the other. So, uh, <laughs> 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 I got a bed at 9:30. Wherever I'm doing, <laughs> <laughs> so I just fall asleep. Should manage that. Yeah, no, I, I, any time. I'm fine. It, it, it'll not be. Yes. <laughs> will be nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> questions. Uh, thanks for a really uh, cool. Um Can I get you back to your third point? You were talking about, <laughs> you were talking about forecasting, and yes. you kind of hammered that point on forty years of forecast. And you said you're thinking about primary university with your neural nets. Um, I thought I'd ask you, given that the events that we were really care about are the extreme events, and given that neural nets are creating data that you already have, and given that our time at extremes might change you, I'm seeing a problem there. You can't quite train you know, AI and neural nets to predict the one in a thousand years and one hundred years ahead. But that's the one that you guys care about. So how on earth are we going to deal with that? I'd be really curious to see your thoughts. Well, you know, I, I think that's a good question. So, um, so there's a couple of thoughts. One is, I don't know, you know, how extreme the extreme events are anymore. So, so you know, I, I mean, take a look at what's happened in the last several weeks, right? <coughs> Five hurricanes were hit in the middle Atlantic. Got uh, last summer, we had 45 degree days in, in Sydney, which is one of you know, it's pretty incredible. Um, so, part of what I think AIMO has to actually think about is uncertainty. So, what we can't, and we never will, and no operator ever can guarantee a hundred percent outcome because things fall over. <coughs> Storms happen, and you don't, you know, you, there are extreme days that if you, you know, you're not going to build a power plant just because you might have this day in one in 30 years. But that's where I think demand can be very helpful. So I think one of the things that the skill set we're going to, well, I know one of the skill sets we have to develop is managing uncertainty as opposed <laughs> to managing predictability and what kind of capability and flexibility we need in our systems to manage through that uncertainty. And it's that's where I think these networks and these learning algorithms can do something. One of the things that, uh, when I was at PJM, we, we, we were a, a grid that was about 45,000 megawatts, and we grew from 45,000 megawatts to 162,000 megawatts. And so we had to figure out how we're going to learn to fall through this, this capacity and all this uncertainty. We started working with Rockwell Automation, who does the rocket launches. 
to be able to help the operators so that you can't, an operator just can't look at all this stuff. And so we need these networks to sort of start helping, helping the operators look at these configuration events and make a determination of what's important and what's not. It's not like they can sit at a screen and look at all the generators and the lights will flash when you think about all the things that are going on now. So it's, it's really, I think, these smart systems that are, that are going to be necessary for us and dealing with the uncertainty. So the question of Jerry that Dr. Volk is setting up and running in the UK for an investment bank. So I've seen a, a lot of what you've described uh, a few years ahead of Australia. Is it great to talk with a blend of innovation and incumbency? So I want to pick up two of the points of incumbency that you, you spoke of. Um, a belief in wholesale markets. They're, they're a pretty artificial construct that um, really has limited substitution and they haven't actually brought on much new capacity. There's a thesis in the UK that they're just not going to survive and that we're going to end up with kind of regulated feeding tariffs for renewables and then capacity markets for, for thermal because you can't survive in South Australia for a thermal getting negative $3 a megawatt like this all the other day. So interesting whether you see wholesale markets surviving and then the grid, which is often a social asset, and then you talked about it in that way. Is there any way the grid can't, can survive in private hands, or do we just need to jump to nationalising it because it's a social asset? Okay, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, it's a happy thought. <laughs> so, so, one is I think the wholesale markets will survive. They need to get more, they're, they, they have to get more complex, more granular. Uh, because for now, so what, I look at it this way. The, when we, do, we have an energy only market. In, in Australia, we don't have a capacity market like they do in parts of the US. The, um, but when, when we designed the market, we were able to pay for energy only. And with that, we got frequency, we got voltage support, we got capacity, capability. But we didn't pay separately for it because of the fact that we didn't need to, it sort of came with the kit, right? Now, we have resources that provide zero margin energy, but they're not necessarily providing inertia or other resources. So we have to start unbundling, very much like we did in communication. We used to just pay for dial tone. I, I think there's probably a lot of people in this room who don't even know what a dial tone is. <laughs> so, uh, so we have to think about it's just an unbundling process with more discrete products that we will optimize as a system operator. But that means that if, for example, a generator is supplying reliability, they should pay, get paid for that as a resource because they're providing a capability, in other words, ability to respond that needs to be monetized in the market. And then the other piece that we have to think about, and this is where intervention you know, needs to occur, is the sense of if you have Resources, you know, dropping in costs. And these are things that policymakers need, you know, think about. What's your transition plan? So I, I won't talk about Australia because I'm, it's not my role. I'll tell you what we did in New York, which was highly controversial, but I thought I still think it was a good decision. We were 30% nuclear in New York. The governor had a goal to be at 50% uh, renewables, but more importantly, had a goal to reduce his emissions. And we knew that if we allowed one of those nuclear plants to retire, because they're all losing money, without a subsidy, that every dollar we had spent on emission reduction in the last 30 years would be lost. And that more likely that that nuclear plant was going to be replaced by new gas, which would be around for another 50 years. So we made it, this is what policymakers have to do, we made a determination that was cheaper to actually pay a subsidy for the nuclear plants to stay open until we got more renewables in the grid, then to allow them to shut down, have to pay for a bunch of new gas, and have to pay again to reduce our emissions. And so those are the kind of things we need to think about in Australia is what's this transition? And if there needs to be some support for existing resources, and I'm not saying there should be, that's the kind of thing that policy needs, makers need to think about as opposed to going out and building new plants that is going to be around for a long time, but may, we may be missing the opportunity because the transitions are very quickly. So that's kind of this combination of, of things. On the grid itself, I don't think it should be government. I think it's fine to keep it in private hands. 
I don't think you're going to see a lot of competition in the system. In other words, there's, uh, is, there's still, I think, an economy of scale around distribution systems and transmission systems. And it's very hard to operate a system with multiple owners because it's truly real time. So I, I don't see any reason to socialize that. I think the markets can be more exciting. The other thing that's going to happen is what I call vertical coupling. Which is, is that rather than the markets just being the bulk power markets, now you're going to have the just the retail markets, and they're going to be coupled, and they're going to have greater depth and variety. And so, you know, when you see people doing blockchain and really interesting transactive <coughs> energy at the edge of the system, that's only going to happen if you have wholesale markets, because you're you really it's really a supply and demand so, and equation. And demand is now much more efficient. So I think in the Countries that don't have markets, they'll be slow to the game in this level of innovation that's happening at the Blue Ridge. Yes, uh, I'm interested in the storage question. Uh, apparently, we have some hundreds of uh, sites for small to medium that pump hydro that really could be turned on quickly. What will it take for this to happen in the short term? <laughs> uh, that I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the price signals are. I know that, that that's being looked at. And I, and I certainly know from everything that the uh, Prime Minister said that he sees this as a huge asset. So um, I, would, I would think that it's the kind of thing we'd want to do, right? Which just gets to my point. We wouldn't want to just send a market signal if we're really, you know, we have a combination of an emissions goals along with, with price goals is to take a look at these resources and figure out what kind of market design it's going to take to, to actually get them up and going. So I don't know the answer of what it would take. I know it should be looked at and see if it's not happening organically in the market to understand why. Thank you, Audrey, for having a great presentation. My name is Quinn, and I'm a PhD student at the Australian General Climate Movement College. And, uh, um, uh, according to the uh, uh, recently published report from AMO, saying that uh, there is a uh, possibility, there are uh, likelihood of the top four policy around 26 to 40 something percent in South Australia and in, uh, and in Victoria. And um, if the unprecedented events occur in uh, these two things, these, these two states, what are all the action plans in the um, uh, contingency that you uh, would be responsible to? So, just to be clear, what we AMO forecasted is that if we did nothing, we would have a risk. But we, we did not do nothing. We did a lot. So, uh, we've been working with all the generators and the transmission folks to make sure that they're ready. We've been making sure that there's fuel available. But we also have worked with Arena and, um, and, st and through our own reserve process. And so, we create an innovative program around demand response. But we're also looking, in addition to that, a uh, thousand megawatts of uh, emergency resources that, that we're also contracting for. And then in addition to that, uh, we're putting in a battery. Well, South Australia is putting in a battery. They're putting in more generation. Victoria is putting in a battery. So all, all those, what we said was, if we, if we had not taken the steps that we took to prepare for the summer, there was a risk, which is why we took the steps. So, and so I feel like we're in good shape. Again, as an operator, I'm never going to say we're in perfect shape. And I can promise everybody, don't, you know, nothing will happen. But I would be saying that if I were in Philadelphia at PJM too. Things happen. This is a real time system. Things break, storms happen, things like that. So you you're, you're always have a risk of an outage. But that, but we have sufficient resources to get us through even extreme days. Thank you, Audrey, for your sure. talk tonight. Um, there's a lot of excitement in Australia from our, a lot of residents. Uh, for a residential battery. Uh, there's a lot of people talking about reconfection as well. Um, I don't believe that reconfection is a good thing. Um, there's a lot of solar on, on rooftops that once the batteries are full, would be able to export that energy to the grid, which is a valuable resource. Um, 
would you say uh, that it would be uh, useful for all residential battery systems to have the ability to, go, to provide network services? Yes. <laughs> well, I, 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 think, I don't think the, the, the idea that you're going to have a bunch of isolated systems, right? I mean, the, the value you have, this is, is, at least really, is the, is the integrated system. And if the ability is, is to actually use these resources to manage an integrated system, make it more productive, is exactly what's so exciting. I think it would be a shame if people do grid defection and we think about that because, you know, these things would break. And, and, and uh, but the other piece is we can, it, it actually, you get more value because of diversity. And so one of the things I'm excited about is one of the areas that we're gonna be exploring is the capability of creating these uh, renewable sites, large scale renewable sites with, with thinking about are there places in the country where if you put the renewables, you can add transmission associated with it. It's one you get much higher value, wind, and much higher value solar. And think about <coughs> how you can connect that and drive value back to the system and take advantage of the sunsets at different times. You have different weather patterns, and you can move the energy better. So far from, I think, distributed resources will have value, probably greater value than historically. But I think it's the integrated whole where we take advantage of, you know, as I keep saying, just make the orchestra bigger. More instruments and the music will get better. Uh, that's what we really want to do. Awesome. Can we hear from some of the women in the room? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't going to ask the question, but after that, <laughs> my name is Andrea Bunting. Um, thank you for a uh, fantastic talk. Um, very impressed that you've managed to get demand management on the agenda. <laughs> and, and now I really have hope that something will happen this year. But we seem to have dropped the ball in Australia on energy efficiency. So we were having this whole conversation around energy prices and you know, massive energy bills, and it's all around the supply side. So um, the demand side in terms of, of the demand side I mentioned is, is great, but can we also, how do we also get that energy efficiency back on the agenda? Um, strong regulations from government, I think is what required, as well as if there's anything that that you could do to shift the agenda around as well. <laughs> uh, well, you know, again, it's, it's sort of, um, it's not what it, in those role to, to determine policy. But I, I, I mean, I'll just tell you, I think energy efficiency, obviously, the, the car, the electron you don't use is the cheapest and probably the cleanest, so it's not a, it's a good thing. I think, uh, you know, certainly if we can make the markets more vibrant around demand markets, there's an opportunity when people are putting in these resources, you are becoming necessarily more efficient and you become more energy aware. So the likelihood of being able to develop those markets for energy efficiency makes sense. But I, I, I'm going to have to, as much as I would love to, it gets me in trouble when I step that far out of my path. <laughs> Good evening, and good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Uh, the right. um, good evening, Lord Lee, uh, welcome to Australia. Um, the question I've got is uh, something which has just come out of really left field. Uh, you mentioned uh, what I call your Australian, Australia we could sort of export our technology to other countries uh, for um, in solar or wind or, or whatever. Um, many years ago, our telecommunications company, Telstra, used to do that, go to a lot of uh, third world countries and give their expertise and technology. Have you actually identified any Australian companies that can 
step into the breach and do that, or is it all AGLs and Elon Musk's and uh, that origin? And AGL, origin. Um, so, yeah, you know, certainly, I mean, there's a few things I see at Arena, like Wingsuit, Posigen. I mean, there's some really fascinating companies. Um, the um, one in her. Hmm? The what? What watchers? What? What watchers? Um, um, but Charles, you have a bunch. Yeah. Reposit. Reposit. I mean, there are a lot of companies that are really doing fascinating things around this, and I um, thought of a couple of really cool, some really cool blockchain companies are looking at things. So I, I um, all that. Um, Arena actually invested in a company that is now producing solar, solar voltaic cells, the cheapest in the world, and they're being used everywhere. So I, you know, I think there's a huge opportunity for Australia to lead. I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, because of our, just the way we're situated, there's a lot of the needs we have, I think, are going to be the needs that we're, we're leading the world in terms of penetration of solar and wind and that kind of stuff. Oh, hi. Sorry, you know, I didn't realize it, but yeah, I, mean, one, I think it's fair to say that one thing the national electricity market hasn't delivered is new transmission. And uh, one of the things that uh, my understanding of people is that he was saying is that uh, AMO should identify uh, new transmission lines to connect renewables. Uh, I, I think a new line to South Australia would be a fantastic uh, thing. It would basically make South Australia more reliable if a new interconnector was built. Does I know um, got plans for looking at new transmission lines? Yes, yeah, we do. So, so our, I mean, that is the regional planning role that we, we've, we've been, uh, are assuming under the Finkel. So it is to look at not just inter-regional, but interstate. And um, Alan went to Texas, where he met with the folks there. They have something called the Crez Project, which, anyway, the, the text, what they did is they said, similar to a lot of places, solar and wind was all in West Texas. People lived in East Texas. So the government went and said, well, why don't we build a transmission line to, to move it? And it's that kind of things that you're seeing where, where we could be looking at these projects, and, um, identifying the best areas, and then socialize it, make it better. But that would be on TMS Raw and something we would do with the transmission asset owners. And I, they're very nice to them, and it's just for us to get going. Uh, so, I'm from the uh, University of the Engineering area. Um, I'm a traditional engineer, so, you know, in this. And I'm a lawyer, and I just played an engineer my whole career. <laughs> <laughs> I have played as an engineer for yeah. my life. Maybe a good or bad thing. Uh, I, I'm very impressed by your talk. What I think I've been telling my students is that all sorts of things are coming in to the industry, in actually in every industry, which will dramatically transform uh, what's going on. Um, but my particular one is also what the previous speaker was saying about uh, transmission. Um, my back of the envelope calculation indicate that you can put a major incremental investment. In $10 million into major transmission. Uh, and the average cost per megawatt hour delivered would be only two or three. It's trivial compared with the variations in market prices we've been seeing. And it does solve many problems. I mean, you don't have a market. We're only five separate markets. And you don't have a market, you can't transport commodities. And the East West type time zone, the ability to put renewables where the most cost effective really relies on transmission. It seems to me a fairly good path to go, but you know, can you find the groups that want to put up that money to build a regulated um, asset? Yeah, they do. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 yes, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. Historically, we had a bias towards just allowing the market to solve issues. 
And the way I'm thinking about it is, is that you know, we, we built a system by engineers who did low power flows and all those things. It's not going to happen by accident. And it, as you know, it takes 10 years to build transmission if you're everything mm -hmm. goes well. So it's going to have to be a planning activity on while where are the best locations in the country to site these from uh, overall economic and then uh, I, you know, a process so that we get the people to, to the table. But I, I have no, no, we talk to the transmission owners. They're very, they, they would very much like to, to be looking at that. We've had some, we have some regulatory challenges to go through that we're gonna have to go over, but RITC is one. But I think we can, you know, they look, as a, I mean, this is where, yeah, yeah. Because the possibility, look, you introduce a proper market, yeah. Single market, <laughs> so you don't have the manipulation of prices in markets that we're seeing at the moment. So, so I, I the, the example that I, you know, <coughs> I took, I took a total the so example we did is when PJM when we expanded the market. I mean, there's still much, and they save about twenty-two billion dollars a year off their energy costs simply because they're able to move power from Chicago to New Jersey, and so um, having a these networks and strengthening the networks. First of all, make them more flexible so we'll be able to deal with issues better. Secondly, it allows for us to take advantage of diversity and make better use of assets. So I think, I think, and frankly, I think one of the things that people saw in the States and is not talked about here as much is that um, for renewables, because renewables tend to be the best wind places and the best solar, tend to be further away from where people live is that transmission, which used to be a dirty word, you know, people, when I was doing transmission in the 80s, you know, people would come over and not hold the towers because it was all about importing coal. But now folks are realizing that actually we need these networks in order to help support the grid, uh, support a zero uh, carbon grid. So I think it's, that mindset is changing. And you can do things, you know, towers are no longer lattice anymore. They're not as, as, as a Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I have to interrupt you because of apologies. Two questions ago, I was told we had two questions to go. <laughs> now, I had this problem of, of multiple bosses. My <laughs> ultimate boss is sat right in front of me as president of the ATA, so she is going to have the last question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and some time ago, on the other side of the room, there was a gentleman who was waving in a quite agitated sort of fashion. So if we may extend it to two more final questions, please. Uh, we'll let Bernie go first with a brief one, please, Bernie. I'll try to do a brief answer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Right. I'm still not getting your question. So, so the network costs are considerable. So how do we do those costs then? So, so um, I I think that, that there's a few things we can do. One is is that I think one is is looking at how you use demand resources better. So so looking at what people call non-wire alternatives. So if you can use demand-based resources better, example, I you know we do that. We did in New York where we avoided building a substation in Brooklyn by using things, batteries and solars better is one way because if you don't need to, if you don't need to build these networks with the right incentives, you can get there. But um, I also think you know, uh, you know, that there's this sort of fear, this thing about gold plating. Gold plating is like, to me, is different than building resources to drive down the total bill. And, and I look at it as is that what we have to start thinking about is that consumers pay for the total bill. And if it's cheaper for a consumer to build an interconnection to be, make better use of the solar 
and wind, then duplicating resources, then we should be looking at that. And, and so I think that the answer is we shouldn't be fearful of the question. Our goal is to actually drive the best outcome for consumers. And if that means investing in networks rather than generation, that's great. The regulator needs to make sure that the process that is used, and you could use competitive processes around that, is that the outcome is the cheapest, but that the investment that's made is the one that creates the best outcome. So you can, so I would separate a regulatory issue from a design and planning issue. <coughs> Okay, well, that's just a final question. Okay. So, um, and thank you for that. Uh, if I may impose upon you to progress this issue, because we have in Victoria smart letters at phones and the premises. We have the capacity to do far more around energy efficiency on the site. Uh, and one of the major challenges that we have is obviously the supply of the pricing that we have. I know it may not be your key area of concern, but surely with around pricing systems regulations, incentives and requirements, even be it as a white certificate scheme for investment by uh, energy companies into efficiencies and to businesses and to homes, there must be ways we can integrate this and progress this. What would you say would be some of the key priority actions that we should take as a priority in Australia, if not here in Victoria, in addition to what, for example, the Australian government is doing with the Energy Jobs Fund and other sorts of initiatives? What would you say would be the key way to progress energy efficiency? I think that um, the one is, is certainly what you said just before, some of these extra posts. It's amazing when you change codes and requirements and how that can help the community. So I think that um, and I, I'm not sure what the codes are here, but building codes and different programs around that can be helpful. Certainly appliance codes, all those white good type things. Um, efficiencies, requirements around that will drive change because manufacturers will, will respond to that. So that that's a you know, that's something that universally, I think, the cities, smart cities, which I know uh, Melbourne is part of, can start driving that because uh, they, will, they will change the manufacturers if the cities get sustainable cities start talking about where they want the efficiencies of these goods to go. And that'll take time because people don't buy refrigerators and air conditioners and things regularly. Um, certainly tightening the buildings would be helpful. I think one of the things that, you know, I, this is personal, I, as a regulator, I always feel like targets are really helpful. Um, one of my snarkier comments, which I didn't make up, but, but people have used, is that, you know, people, there's nice ways to say, say all regulation is incentive regulation, you just incentive different behavior. Um, one of the, my favorite utility executives said all the utilities are like rats and maze. And, Go after the chief, you move the chief, they'll figure it out. So if you set targets and goals, they'll, they'll get there. And I think um, one of the things that's not talked about is just what's the market potential. How do we set a target towards that and then design our programs towards achieving those targets? So I, I would say having that real discussion <coughs> about what, the, and then what we can provide is, at an email is. Well, what's the alternative? If we're able to take uh, reduced demand by 10 people, well, thank you all. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>